Okay, I'm going to assume now that you have an idea of what an internal control is. And in this lesson, we're going to use a framework to describe a system of internal controls of a company. The COSO framework of internal controls defines the entity's controls as those that are implemented for multiple transaction cycles or for the entire organization. The control environment consists of the active promotion of ethical values and integrity throughout the organization, a commitment to the establishment of competence, an active and qualified board of directors and audit committee. The board of directors should be independent of management and exist to challenge management and scrutinize management's effectiveness. The audit committee has oversight responsibility for financial reporting and acts as a conduit between management and the external auditors. Next, we have the control environment, which is heavily influenced by management's philosophy and operating style. Employees take their cues from the company's leaders to determine how seriously internal controls factor into their priorities. Human resource policies are critically important to ensure that the company hires competent and trustworthy people. Business structures, authority and responsibility and management control methods factor into the control environment. And as well, as we've discussed, the IT systems have a pervasive impact. The existence and effectiveness of an internal audit function can greatly enhance the operations of an entity. So there's a lot to evaluate before you can make an assessment as to whether a company has an effective control environment or not. The other components of the COSO internal control framework that get considered after we've assessed the control environment include preparing risk assessments, designing and implementing control activities to address the risks, and providing information and communications to manage the risks, and monitoring the control systems to ensure the ongoing effectiveness. A risk assessment requires management to identify all the risks. Or said another way, what could go wrong in a transaction cycle? Then management needs to assess the likelihood and significance of a risk occurring to identify those which are critical. And finally, the company develops a course of action to reduce risk to an acceptable level by performing control activities. Control activities can include manual, automated, and computer-assisted controls. For example, a computer-assisted control would be having a manager review an exception report generated by the system of, say, outstanding and unmatched purchase orders, which, by the way, would be a control to address completeness and cut off of accounts payable. Automated controls are those that are built into the IT system. For example, if we accept reservations from guests through our websites, how can we ensure the accuracy of that information? Well, our reservation system will have to have various controls built in to ensure that the customer completes all of the fields on the screen to ensure accuracy before accepting the reservation. These sorts of IT controls are called application controls, and they are designed to achieve three objectives. First, that the information input into the system is correct, such as the example I just provided. Second, that the application control ensures that the information is processed correctly by the system. And thirdly, that the application control ensures that the outputs from the system are correct. Now before we can safely say that these application controls are effective, we need to ensure that there's overall system integrity. General computer controls are akin to entity level controls, only in a system sense, in that they are pervasive across multiple transaction cycles and across different software applications. For example, if someone has the ability to hack into the system and change the programming code, then it really doesn't matter how fancy the input processing or output application controls are because the overall integrity of the system is jeopardized because the malicious individual has the opportunity to cover their tracks. The key areas for general computer controls can be summarized into three categories, though many literature uses more detailed categories. First, we have segregation of duties. And essentially that means we don't want the people who have access to the code to also have access to the transactional data. Secondly, we want to ensure that there is adequate system acquisition, development, and maintenance controls in place. Anytime the IT system changes, for whatever reason, controls must be in place to ensure that the data tra is transitioned accurately to the new system and that the new system contains all the necessary controls that the old system had. And thirdly, we want to ensure that there's adequate operational controls and support. 
and these controls cover off such things as the backup and recovery procedures, the physical and logical access, which are all very important. We don't want unauthorized users gaining access to our systems. If general computer controls are not effective, then it's unlikely we can replace much reliance on the application controls. And this leaves us with only those manual controls left to meet the company's objectives. So let's look at those next. Now manual controls fall into a number of broad categories as well. We have segregation of duties, documentation, physical controls, and independent checks. And let's look at these each in turn. Segregation of duties is one of those fundamental internal control principles, which broadly states that if we can design job positions such that one person cannot control a transaction in its entirety, then it's more likely to prevent and detect an error or a fraud from happening. Segregation can be a tricky concept to evaluate, let alone remember, but the golden rules are segregate the custody of an asset from its accounting, segregate the operational responsibility from the accounting, segregate the systems development from the accounting, segregate computer operations from accounting, segregate reconciliation and independent checking from the accounting, and segregate the authorization of the transactions from the custody of the assets. Let's do a little knowledge check to see these kind of rules and principles and actions before we go on. Betty maintains the accounts receivable subledger and she also receives the daily cash receipts so that she can update the records. Okay or not? No, this is not okay as she has custody of the asset, cash, and is responsible for the accounting of that asset, accounts receivable. This is fun, let's do one more. Brian is the controller, but from time to time the system acts up and misposts a journal entry. The only way to correct the journal entry is for Brian to go into the journal entry database and delete the journal entry. Okay or not? No, this too is not okay as Brian is now doing both the computer operations and the accounting. It's possible that he could manipulate other journal entries in the database and bypass the controls over posting journal entries. Do you get the idea of what segregation of duties implies? It generally means that one individual does not have control of a transaction from cradle to grave. Next, let's look at what we meant by adequate documentation. This simply means that there should be adequate records to establish an audit trail that can be followed for each transaction. Some principles for the proper design and use of documentation include documents should be pre-numbered or automatically numbered to ensure everything is recorded and nothing is missed. Documents should be prepared at the time that the transaction takes place to eliminate mistakes from memory lapses. Documents should be well designed and easily understood to encourage correct preparation. Next, we have physical controls over the assets and records to ensure that assets are not stolen, lost, or damaged. Physical controls include such things as locks on doors and security cameras. Logical access is the electronic equivalent using log on credentials and passwords. Protection of our electronic assets, such as our files and our customer data, is often just as important as protecting our tangible assets like cash, inventory, and fixed assets. And last, but certainly not least, we have independent checks, which are a control activity that alleviates self-review bias. For example, the person who performs the bank reconciliation is checking to ensure that the people who have deposited the cash, prepared the checks, and accounted for the transactions have reported them correctly. The last two areas of the COSO internal control framework are the information and communications component, which is in essence the ability of the accounting system to report the activity of the company in a manner that allows for management to take action. And lastly, the monitoring component ensures that the system of internal controls is periodically and continuously evaluated, ensuring that it operates as designed and is effective. Monitoring often falls to the internal audit department who is independent of management and often has a direct reporting relationship to the audit committee. This has been a rather fulsome discussion of what internal controls really are. What you need to walk away from this lesson understanding is a few things. Number one, recognize that to have effective internal controls at the transaction level, you first need effective controls at the entity level. Secondly, the same can be said about automated controls. Before you can rely on application controls, you need to evaluate and ensure the effectiveness of general computer controls. Thirdly, controls are established by companies to mitigate risk. And control activities mitigate risk specifically 
and in turn enable management to make certain assertions about various transaction cycles and balances. In the next lesson, we will talk about how we go about auditing internal controls. So until then, don't stop to get to the top. When you get to the top, don't stop.